let's continue with the second chapter. I think we're going to finish it of Cold Comfort Farm. Um, Flora has decided that she is going to live with the Stark Adders because they sound so mysterious, and Mrs. Smiling now continues to talk to her about it. Well, said Mrs. Smiling, it sounds like an appalling place, but in a different way from all the others. I mean, it does sound interesting and appalling, Well, the others just sound appalling. If you have really made up your mind to go, and if you will not stay here with me, I think you had best go to Sussex. You will soon grow tired of it anyhow, and then, when you have tired it, when you have tried it out and seen what it is really like to live with relatives, you will be ready to come sensibly back here and learn how to work. Flora thought it was wiser to ignore the last part of the speech. Yes, I think I will go to Sussex, Mary. I am anxious to see what Cousin Judith means by rights. Oh, do you think she means some money? Or perhaps a little house? I should like that even better. Anyway, I shall find out when I get there. And when do you think I had better go? Today is Friday. Suppose I go down on Tuesday after lunch? Well, surely you needn't go so soon. After all, there is no hurry. Probably you will not be there for, an, for longer than three days. So, when does it, so what does it matter when you go? You're all eager about it, aren't you? I want my rights, said Flora. Probably they are something too useless, like a lot of used-up mortgages. But if they are mine, I am going to have them. Now you go away, Mary, because I am going to write all these good souls, and that will take time. Flora had never been able to understand how railway timetables worked, and she was too conceited to ask Mrs. Smiling or Sneller about trains to Howling. So in her letter, she asked her cousin, cousin Judith, if she would mention a few trains to Howling, and what time they got in, and who would meet her and how. It was true that in novels dealing with agricultural life, no one ever did anything so courteous as to meet a train, unless it was the object of cutting in under the noses of the other members of the family, with, with some sordid or passionate end in view. But that was no reason why the Stark Adders, at least, should not begin to form civilized habits. So she wrote firmly, Do let me know what trains there are near Howling, and which ones you will meet, and sealed her letter with a feeling of satisfaction. Sneller posted it in time for the country collection that evening. Mrs. Smiling and Flora passed their time pleasantly during the next two days. In the morning, they went ice skating at River Park Ice Club with Charles and Dicky, and another of the pioneers, though, whose nickname was Swooch, or, or was Swooth, and who came from Tanzan from Tanganyika. Though he and Bicky were extremely jealous of one another, and in consequence suffered horrid torments, Mrs. Smiling had them both so well in hand that they did not dare look they did not dare to look miserable, but listened seriously while she told them, each in his turn, as they glided round the rink holding her hands, how distressed she was about yet a third of the pioneers though, named Goofy who was on his way to China, and from whom she had not heard for ten days. "'I'm afraid the poor child may be worrying,' Mrs. Smiling would say vaguely, which was her way of indicating that Goofy had probably committed suicide out of the depths of unrequited passion. And Bicky, or Swooth, knowing from their own experience that this was indeed probably the case, would respond cheerfully, "'I know you shouldn't fret if I were you, Mary. "'Oh, I shouldn't fret if I were you, Mary.' and feel happier at the thought of Goofy's sufferings. In the afternoons, the five went flying to, or, the, or to the zoo, or to hear music, and in the evenings they went to parties, that is, Mrs. Smiling and the two pioneers, though, went to parties, where yet more young men fell in love with Mrs. Smiling, and Flora, who, as we know, loathed parties, dined quietly with intelligent men, a way of passing the evening, which she adored, because then she could show off a, lo show off a lot and talk about herself. No letter had come by Monday evening at tea time, and Flora thought that her departure would probably have to be postponed until Wednesday. But the last post brought her a limp postcard, and she was reading at half past ten, reading at a half past ten, on her return from one of the showing off dinners, when Mrs. Smiling came in, having wearied of nasty of the nasty party, of a nasty party which she had been attending. Does it give the times of the trains, my dove? asked Mrs. Smiling. It is dirty, isn't it? I can't help rather wishing it were possible for the Stark Adders to send a clean letter. It says nothing about trains, replied Flora with reserve. So far as I can make out, 
it appears to be some old some verses with which I must confess I am not familiar from the Old Testament. There is also a repetition of the assurance that there have always been stock at us at Cold Comfort Farm, though why it should be necessary to impress this upon me, I am at a loss to imagine. Oh, do not say it is signed by Seth. It is signed Seth Reuben, cried Mrs. Smiling fearfully. It is not signed at all. I gather that it is from some member of the family who does not welcome the prospect of my visit. I can distinguish a reference, among other things, to vipers. Among other things, to vipers. I must say that I think it would have been more to the point to give a list of the trains, but I suppose it is a little illogical to expect such attention to petty details after a doomed family lived in, from a doomed family living in Sussex. Well, Mary, I shall go down tomorrow. After lunch, as I planned, I will wire them in the morning to say I am coming. Shall you fly? No, there is no landing stage nearer than Brighton. Besides, I must save money. You and Sneller can work out a route for me. You will enjoy fussing over that. Of course, darling, said Mrs. Smiling, who was by now beginning to feel a little unhappy at the prospect of losing her friend. But I wish you would not go. Flora put the postcard in the fire. Her determination remained unmoved. The next morning, Mrs. Smiling looked up trains to Howling, while Flora superintended the packing of her trunks by Riante, Mrs. Smiling's maid. Even Mrs. Smiling could not find much comfort in the timetable. It seemed to her even more confused than usual. Indeed, since the aerial routes and the well-organized road routes had, appro had appropriated three-quarters of the passengers who used to make their journeys by train, the remaining railway companies had fallen into a settled melancholy, an idle and repining despair invaded their literature, and its influence was noticeable even in their timetables. There was a train which left London Bridge at half past one for Howling. It was a slow train. It reached Godmere at three o'clock. At Godmere, the traveler changed into another train. It was a slow train. It reached Beershorn at six o'clock. At Beershorn, this train stopped and there was no more idle chatter of the arrival and departure of trains. Only the simple sentence, Howling, see Beershorn, mocked in its self-sufficing entry the traveler, so Flora decided to go to Beershorn and try her luck. I expect Seth will meet you there in a jaunting car. Sorry, my phone stand fell over. I'm going to continue reading anyway. I expect Seth will meet you in a jaunting car, said Mrs. Smiling as they sat down to an early lunch. Their spirits were rather low by this time. And to look out of the window at Lambeth, where the gay little houses were washed by pale sunshine, and to think that she was to exchange the company of Mrs. Smiling and flying and showing off dinners for the rigors of cold comfort and the grossness of the star catters did not make Flora more cheerful. She snapped at poor Mrs. Smiling. One does not have jaunting cars in England, Mary. Do you never read anything but houseman half-knits half on braziers? Jaunting cars are indigenous to Ireland. If Seth meets me at all, it will be in a, in a wagon or a buggy. Well, I do hope he won't be called Seth, said Mrs. Smiling earnestly. If he is, Flora, mind you write me at once, and about gumboots, too. Flora had risen, for the car was at the door and was adjusting her hat upon her dark gold hair. I will, Wyatt, but I do not see what good it will do, she said. She was feeling downright morbid, and her sensations were unpleasantly complicated by the knowledge that it was entirely due to her own obstinacy that she was setting out at all upon this absurd and disagreeable pilgrimage. Oh, but it will, because I can send things. What things? Oh, proper clothes and cheerful fashion papers. Is Charles coming to the station? asked Flora as they took their seats in the car. He said he might. Why? Oh, I don't know. He rather amuses me, and I quite like him. The journey through Lambeth was un through Lambeth was unmarked by any incident save that Flora pointed out to Mrs. Smiling that a flower shop named named Orchid named Orchidaceous Limited 
had been opened upon the site of the old police station in Caroline Place. Then the car drew into London Bridge Yard, and there was Flora's train, and Charles carrying a bunch of flowers, and Bicky and Swoof looking pleased because Flora was going away, and Mrs. Smiling, they so feverishly hoped, would have more time to spend in their company. Curious. How... Curious how love destroys every vestige of that politeness which the human race, in its years of evolution, has so painfully acquired, reflected Flora, as she leaned out of the carriage window and observed the faces of Bicky and Swoof. Shall I tell them that Mig is expected home from Ontario tomorrow? No, I think not. It would be downright sadistic. Goodbye, darling, cried Mrs. Smiling as the train began to move. Goodbye, said Charles, putting his daffodils, which he had forgotten until that moment, into Flora's hands. Don't forget to phone me if it gets too much for you, and I will come and take you away in Speed Cop 2. I won't forget, Charles, dear. Thank you very much, though I am quite sure I shall find it very amusing, and not at all too much for me. Goodbye, cried Bicky and Swoof. And Swoof, falsely composing their faces into some semblance of regret. Goodbye, don't forget to feed the parrot, shrieked Flora, who disliked the, prolong the prolongation of the ceremony of saying farewell, as every civilized traveler must. What parrot? They all shrieked back from the fast receding platform, just as they were meant to do. But it was too much trouble to reply. Flora contented herself with muttering, Oh, any parrot, bless you all. And with a final affectionate wave of her hand to Mrs. Smiling, she drew back into the carriage and opening a fashion journal, composed herself for the journey. And that is the end of chapter two.